I know that this morning you'll be very excited to know we're going to talk about the joy of sex. Back in 1972, Dr. Alex Comfort, C-O-M-F-O-R-T, Comfort, remember that? Remember, yes, had published the groundbreaking illustrated sex manual, The Joy of Sex. For 11 weeks, it was at the New York Times bestseller list at the top. And for 70 more weeks, it was in the top five from 1972 to 1974. Compared to the books that are available today, it was kind of humorous. I mean, it was literally illustrated. In 72, uh, there weren't things like that. Now, you may be able to say, well, there was the Kama Sutra. Yeah, but that really wasn't an American title. Well, this was the first popular American title to really deal with the issue of sex in a less clinical way. In 66, there was a book put out, but it was very clinical, and there were not illustrations. The illustrations really put it over the top. And of course, a lot of people wanted to call it pornography. So you can imagine the world was up in arms, especially the religious world was up in arms about it. As I was thinking about my bland titles and having different titles, because it's fun to think about different titles. I mean, it's fun to stretch our minds. It's fun to look at the work in different ways. So when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about this morning, which is the joy of negativity, it reminded me of the joy of sex because I was in ministerial school when the book came out. And it was a big deal. And in the school that I was in, it was applauded as, oh, it's new age, groundbreaking, you know, and ra da 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 it's wonderful. I never read the book. I never even looked at the pictures. I was not interested much in the joy of sex. I figured, who cares? But obviously the whole world cared, or at least the, the Americans cared. So I don't think there's going to be a book anytime soon called The Joy of Work, The Joy of the Work, <laughs> mainly because... We don't take much joy in the work, and that's unfortunate, really, because we could. You can see how unpopular the book would have to be already when we say the work has these little catchphrases like, don't express negative emotions. Of course, the first thing people say is, well, I never express negative emotions. And then they have to have a couple of negative emotions pointed at them. Well, <laughs> well, yes, well every once in a while, I, it's true, I do express a negative emotion. But it's really not my fault. Of course, it's not your fault. It's the person who made you negative. It's always their fault. It's always the other person's fault. It's never my fault. So there are a lot of things that are said in the work, a lot of little phrases that we can glom onto, that we can grab hold of, that we can memorize. And one of them is, I can work. And another one is, don't express negative emotions. What's another one? Remember yourself. Remember yourself. There are things that we can just, little catchphrases that we can think of. But the problem with those phrases are that they're useless if we try to act on just that part without understanding how it connects to the whole. You got all kinds of people who are remembering themselves and not expressing negative emotions and so on and so forth and working. You know, well, this is an opportunity to work. No matter what happens, oh, well, this is an opportunity to work. They're not working, but they're saying that it's an opportunity to work. But you have to ask yourself, well, why not express negative emotions? I mean, really, why not? If you're in life, if you're under life, if you're under the laws of life, it's perfectly legitimate to express negative emotions. The whole world is doing it. And not only that, the whole world not only accepts it, encourages it. Look at some of the commercials on television that encourage negative emotions. Our whole society encourages negative emotions. Go to a football game, go to a hockey game where negative emotions are enthroned. We're encouraged to express negative emotions in life. The work comes along and says, well, don't express negative emotions. It's not very popular. But if you're in life, then there's no reason not to react to everything mechanically according to your level of being, whatever that may be. But if we seek to be in the work, then we have to become responsible to the work and we can't act as we wish. The first thing we do with that is we make the work the lawgiver that gives the commandments and then we externally obey them slavishly and sometimes grudgingly. The work says, don't express negative emotions. We go, oh, okay, well, I, I can't express negative emotions. I can't express negative emotions. That's bad and wrong. And we end up making it this harness, this limiter on ourselves. But the object of the work is to change mechanicalness. And we don't change mechanicalness by being mechanical in a different way. And to accept, don't express negative emotions as an external commandment from the work or from him, because he said. So what that means is don't express negative emotions around him. We begin disliking our continual mechanical reactions to everything as we come under the influence of the work. 
a genuine influence. As we really start to come under the influence of the work, we start to, through self-observation, real, genuine, sincere self-observation, we begin to see what we're like. And when we begin to see what we're like, we start to dislike how we are. I don't know how some of you live with yourselves. I mean, honestly, I do not. And then I think about it and I think, well, buffers, <laughs> that's how you live with yourselves. If you could see you the way I see you, you would not do the things you do. If I could see me the way you can see me, I would not do the things I do. But I have these buffers that prevent me from seeing the things that you see. And you have buffers that prevent you from seeing the things that the rest of us see. And so you can live with yourself. Otherwise, remove all the buffers and you live with yourself in an insane asylum. Because you'd go insane. You'd go crazy because of all the contradictions. You couldn't do it. When you look at someone and you want to say, I don't know how you can live with yourself. Remember buffers. <laughs> That's how they live with themselves. And it would be great if they knew enough about the work to say, well, the same way you do. Buffers, aren't they wonderful? The joy of buffers. <laughs> the joy of buffers is we remain somewhat sane in our insanity. We're insane because people who are negative, people who are controlled by negative emotions, that's insanity. People who are run or driven by negative emotions, people who are mechanical, that outside things touch here, touch there, and make them do things that they have no control over, that's a good enough definition of insanity for me. You find that you can't live as you did, realizing that you must do something about what you're seeing. The work begins to show you through the light that you let inside through self-observation, what you're like, and it's no longer a satisfactory arrangement to stay that way. You begin to see that it matters how you are inside. Not only does it matter, but then you've got to do something about it. You actually get to the point where you think, I've had it, I've really got to do something about this. The buffers aren't working anymore. They're slowly being dissolved, and you're starting to see the contradictions. Not a lot. So the work is very gentle in that way because it comes from the conscious circle of humanity. It comes from conscious beings. We get what we need when we need it. People don't understand that the work is really an organism. It's a living, organic, whole thing. And it's not the same for everybody. It's like good bacteria. We need good bacteria to live. There's good bacteria on our skin. There's good bacteria in our bodies. And without it, we can't survive. It is doing things that promote life for us, promote health for us. Without it, we're in trouble. And the work is like that. It's like good bacteria. It can be uncomfortable, but it's doing things that promote our life, our health, our unfoldment, our possibility of spiritual and psychological evolution. It's not bad enough that we have to behave differently. See, that's another thing about the work. It's not bad enough that we have to behave differently. We can live with that. But the fact that we have to think and feel differently, that's just going too far. Not only does it want to interfere with how we act, it wants to interfere with how we think and how we feel. Can I have anything? Well, yes, you can have it all. You can have everything that everyone else has in life. No one is trying to take any of that away from you. Trust me, I don't want your negative emotions. I don't want them. Don't give them to me. I don't want to take them away from you. If you want to be negative, be negative. If you want to express negative emotions, express negative emotions all you want. Enjoy yourself. I don't want them. I'm not interested in taking that away from you. You have to come to the point that you don't want them. You have to come to the point where they are so uncomfortable, so unsatisfactory for you, that you would do anything to get rid of them. Then you start to think about changing your thoughts and feelings. Until then, if you're looking for me to tell you don't express negative emotions, forget it. I'm not going to tell you that. Express them all you want. You want to run around and shoot people. Go do that. I don't care. That's not my business. I'll try and stay out of your way. I'll try and stay out from under the law of accident if I can, if I can stay awake long enough. If I can't, well, get what I get, just like everybody else in life. But it takes time to realize that we've never really behaved rightly according to what the work wishes of us. Ever. We've never really behaved rightly. We've always been wrong. You were born right. And then, through your association with all these sleeping people around you, your parents and all of these, all of these teachers and all of the sleeping people in the world, you began to imitate them. And imitating them, you started to be all wrong, just like they are. When we do realize this, it's a rude awakening. So the work gives us what we need, actually. Some people need it like that. Some people need it slow. The work knows much better what we need than we know, because we can't see ourselves people outside of us can see us in a way that we cannot see ourselves. No one is allowed to understand the work until he's ready to understand it. You have to have some infrastructure in order to understand this work. Without it, this is mumbo-jumbo. This is just balderdash. 
Eventually, the work may have an emotional meaning to you. I say may have because some people get stuck in this mental realm, the mental center, and they never let the work have any emotional meaning. They keep it mental because they can control it there. They can keep it from touching them anywhere that's sore. You know what I mean? You go to the doctor and you've got a problem. What's he do? He starts palpitating. He starts taking his hand and pressing it hard in places that you know it's going to hurt. In a sense, the work does that. It's always feeling us out because it is an organic thing. It's alive. So it is interacting with us. You know, it's not just the system that you put on like a suit or a helmet. It's an organic thing. It becomes part of you. It, it starts to interact with you like the bacteria in your body. And you need to understand it this way. You need to understand it as this living thing. It's like a virus that gets inside of you and it starts to change you. It starts to alter you in ways that you can't control. No, right. We want control of everything. And see where our control has gotten us. What got you here is your control. <laughs> what got you to the place of, there's got to be something more in life than just this. If this is what life is about, it's not worth it. There's got to be more. Your control is what got you to that place, to realizing my life is a mess. Even if your life is great, somehow you had to realize that something about it was a mess. Something about it wasn't right. The inner part wasn't right. If everything's fine on the outside, that's even worse. If everything's perfect on the outside, that's even worse. What could be worse than that? Then you have nothing to blame for your internal states. You start to have to manufacture things to blame, like people manufacture dramas for their lives. So you begin to realize only when the work becomes emotional for you, only when you start to interact with it at a deep level, a deep emotional level, you start to have a love for it. You start to have this, at first it starts out as a love-hate relationship. You hate some of the things it makes you do. But later, you submit to it because you know that it has what you want. It has what you need. The more we express negative emotions, the more they feed on us, the more they are nourished by us. And when they are nourished by us, they grow. They increase. Jess and I were working on something yesterday, and he said, whoa, 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 whoa. And I said, Jess, don't even go there. It's not worth getting negative about. It's not worth it. Don't even go there. If you feed it, it will grow. If you give it anything at all, it will just increase. So just stop it. And so we helped each other out because in the work, we're together. We have the same aim. We wanted to express negative emotions. Both of us did. But the work wouldn't let us. It said, no, don't express negative emotion. And when one of us forgot, the other one reminded. And that's the way this is supposed to work. And it worked well. But the joy of negative emotions was there. The joy of negativity was there. It was just calling, calling, calling. Oh, come on, just this little one. I'm pretty sure you're justified in this. It was such a favorite area, too. Yes, it was a great area of negativity. We have lots of old habits and old associations in this area about negativity. So it was just ripe. And so then Matt came over. And what's the first thing Matt did? He looked at everything and went, blah, 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 and got negative. We both, we both laughed. Because that was confirmation. Yes, we're, we're, we're justified in being negative. Oh, hallelujah, let's have a negativity party. The joy of negativity was everywhere. We could have written a book right then. Nobody would read it because they're all writing their own books all the time. Who needs to buy and read ours? They could have their own. They could buy and read it just to reinforce their own. Because let's face it, shared negativity. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, shared negativity. I mean, it's like, what's better than that? What's better than shared negativity? It is. It's delicious. And the joy, incidentally, the joy of sex was based on, they got the idea from the joy of cooking. Apart from the whole, this whole idea of not expressing negative emotions is nothing more than an external commandment that we obey. We've had the Ten Commandments with us for quite a number of years. And then we have the Eleventh Commandment. You remember what the Eleventh Commandment is, right? The Eleventh Commandment is, Thou shalt not be found out. You know that one. Think about it. It's okay, whatever it is you do, it's okay, as long as you're not found out. It's when you're found out. That's when it's not okay. So, Thou shalt not be found out is the Eleventh Commandment. So, the Twelfth Commandment, we're going to have to add, add the Twelfth Commandment, which will be, Thou shalt not be negative. So we've got the Ten Commandments, and we've got the Eleventh Commandment, Thou shalt not be found out. Then we've got the Twelfth Commandment, Thou shalt not be negative. The whole idea becomes obeying external commandment. And the work teaches that negative emotions must gradually be eliminated. You cannot gradually eliminate negative emotions by obeying an external commandment. It can't be done. If it could be done, it would have been done thousands of years ago. Because the Ten Commandments, if people had obeyed them externally, which they do, and they obey the Eleventh too, 
don't be found out. So they break one of the Ten Commandments, but it's okay as long as they obey the Eleventh and not get found out. That's the great thing about the Ten Commandments, is as long as you obey the Eleventh, you don't have to worry about the other Ten. Because it's only external and it doesn't matter. Because it's all external, then being found out is everything. But you see, this work is internal, so being found out doesn't really matter. I mean, when you really get what this work is about, who cares whether you're found out externally or not? I don't care. I would have to care what someone thought about me then. Well, I do care what someone thinks about me. I care what I think about me. That's the most important thing. What the work eyes think about me is the most important thing. And quite frankly, there's not much else has a lot of weight compared with that. And that's what this work is about. That's how it has to shift. It has to shift so that the thing that we love the most is the thing that we serve. And if you love the work the most because of what it will give you, then you will serve it with love, willfully, gratefully, joyfully, happily. As long as we enjoy negative emotions, as long as we're satisfied with them, we're cut off from contact with higher centers. This is what the work is really telling us. Look, if you want to be connected with higher centers, as long as you're enjoying negative emotions consistently, you lose all your contact with higher centers. All the better eyes, all the better thoughts, all the better feelings that you have are all unavailable to you when you're negative. You don't have to be a rocket scientist, and you don't have to be a great self-observer to know this about yourself. When you're negative, you are not at your best. You may be at your best worse, but you're not at your best. You may be at your most angry, you may be at your most cunning, you may be at your most vicious and ferocious, but you're not at your best. And you know that. Intuitively, instinctively, you know that. Now, we justify it, but in our quiet moments, in our better moments, we know that that's not the best in us. A lady back east who I talked to from time to time, or I used to talk to, said, hi, how you doing? Remember me? And you know, she said, oh, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. And we talked for a little bit. And I said, how's it going? She was, it was going horribly. I mean, she was as negative as she could be. I mean, gone. Totally, completely gone. Going to get a divorce, going to leave her husband. Her husband's no longer her husband now. He's the machine. And he doesn't care about her, and he needs to change, and he doesn't care about changing. And, and I said, well, you're the only one can change. Yeah, well, I'm not the one that needs to change. And she was so far down into the pit that I didn't have a rope long enough to reach her. And that's what I'm talking about. Now, you all know mm -hmm. that place. You all know the absolute horror of that place, being so far down in that pit that there isn't a rope long enough to reach you. And even if there was, you wouldn't touch it. No, you don't want it. And that's where she was. And it was such a wonderful thing for me. And so I said, okay, well, nice talking to you. Bye. And I didn't feel the least bit of remorse about it or guilt about it. It's like, hey, you made your choice. This is it. You made your choice. And we do this all the time. And when you make your choice, I'm going to let you make it. I'm going to let you have it. That's what you want. See ya. I'm out of here. And I walked away. I've never been able to do that before. I've never been able to walk away and just say, well, fine. That's your choice. For me, this is a milestone that the work has given me. This is what I call internal growth. I can get to the point where I am no longer enslaved to, I've got to do something about somebody else's negativity. I can't do anything about anybody else's negativity. The only person that I can help, maybe, maybe, is myself. Maybe. There's nothing that I can do for you. At the same time, this is a great freedom and a great blow to the ego. <laughs> they don't need me? No. They don't need you. They can be negative all by themselves without your help. <laughs> they can get out of the pit all by themselves without your help if they want out. If they don't want out, there's nothing that can get them out. Nothing. Jesus Christ could come down from the cross and reach his bloody nail-printed hand into the pit, and they wouldn't take it. Buddha could come off of his meditation cushion <laughs> and reach down into the pit and offer you with all the compassion and love that Buddha is known for, offer you his hand, and they wouldn't take it. The difference between them and us is they know that, and we don't. We keep on trying to yank them up, whether they want to be yanked up or not. We'll drag them out kicking and streaming by the hairs of their heads to satisfy our own ego. But it has nothing whatever to do with them. It's all about us. So to have inner psychological health, we have to mitigate the joy of negativity through separation from the mechanical reactions that we have to everything in life. You know what mitigate means, right, Pat? Uh, I think so. Okay, tell me. It means to decide between two, to 
Okay, anybody else have an idea? To lessen the effect. To lessen the effect of. To mitigate means to lessen the effect of. All we're trying to do is dial down the amplifier a little bit on negative emotions. We're not trying to stop them entirely. You can't. You can't do that. So just dial it down a little bit. That's all that the work is asking from you right now. That's all. Nothing more. Just dial it down a little bit. Why? Because you've begun to see how unpleasant it is living inside of yourself with all of that garbage floating around. It's like opening a window a little bit and letting some fresh air in and some bad air out. That's all that this is. That's all really not expressing negative emotions. That's all that it really is. It's just cracking a window a little bit, turning a fan on a little bit. Just get some of the bad air out and some fresh air in because it's healthier for you. And if you want any psychological health, you've got to begin by doing this. When you become aware that you can't afford negative emotions, it's no longer an outer commandment to obey. No longer something someone else has to tell you. No longer something dictated to you by the work, or the teacher, or Gurdjieff, or Ospensky, or Nicole, or, or whomever. It then becomes something that you want because you're beginning to have a deeper understanding of it. When you have this deeper understanding, when you start to have an emotional feeling for this, then life becomes your teacher. Life starts to show you what you need to do and what you don't need to do. Life starts to show you the areas in which you need to work. Life can be a tough teacher sometimes, even when it's very nice. And what makes it tough is not that life is such a tough teacher, is that we are so resistant. The negative emotions are such an entrenched habit with us that giving them up is like quitting smoking for some people. You know, some people cannot do it, literally cannot do it. They need all kinds of aids. They need special gum and patches and hypnosis and all kinds of things. And they still can't do it. When you begin to see what this is all about, when you begin to understand what negative emotions cost you, what they cost you, maybe not right this second, because right this second you don't care about the cost. Right this second, the only thing you care about is the negative emotion, and nothing else matters. You're willing to pay everything for it. The entire world, you'll give the whole world to have your negative emotion. I know you're smiling. Some of, some of you are smiling because you're looking at it going, oh my God, that's true. And some of you are not smiling because you're looking at it and going, oh my God, that's true. It's a horror, isn't it? And it's a riot, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, and I can see both things. I can see how it can be just a riot. It's like, oh my God, this is so stupid, so funny. And I can see how horrible it can be. I mean, it can be an absolute nightmare. It's a horror show. Negative emotions are a horror show that won't stop. When you turn from the joy of negativity to the horror of negativity, the work has started to do something inside of you emotionally. Can you see the difference emotionally? You can taste the difference. You can smell the difference. You can feel the difference. It's a subtle difference. It's why you have to taste it and smell it and feel it. Because outside you may still be negative, but inside you don't want to be anymore. The struggle for a lot of us in the beginning is, is a struggle for me in the beginning is, and when I say in the beginning, I mean with the beginning of any new area of negativity that I'm dealing with. I'm not talking about in the beginning of dealing with negative emotions. You could be dealing with negative emotions for 10 years, but have some new set of negative habits that you're dealing with. That's the new beginning now. In the beginning, I don't want to give them up. I have to bring the principles of the work to bear on my own mind mentally. Because emotionally, I am not willing to give them up. Mentally, I have to insist. I have to say to myself, I had to do this this morning. I had to say to myself, look, these are not your better eyes. Do not go with these eyes. These eyes mean you no good whatsoever. They only mean you harm. Go with the best eyes that you can remember. You know they're there in you. Reach for them. And I did. And I did not express the very well justified negativity that I had. It was a rock solid case. This case was airtight. I was there, man. I, mean, I was totally justified. And I said, no, these are not good eyes. These eyes are liars. <laughs> these eyes are evil. Get away from them. But boy, emotionally, I did not want to. Emotionally, I wanted to go with them. And mentally, I pulled myself away and didn't do, didn't actually do what those emotional negative eyes wanted to do, those negative emotional eyes wanted to do. Success, progress. It's a little bit, but it's something. And every time we make a little inroad, we weaken the negativity, we strengthen the work eyes in us, and we've added to the plus side, we've added to the light. And any time we add to the light, it dispels a little bit of darkness. Maybe not all of it, but a little bit more. It makes an inroad, it erodes the negativity. It erodes the joy of negativity. Don't get me wrong, the joy of negativity is still there. <laughs> you know, I still was thinking about it, I can't even think about it. 
You know, if I think about it, then, oh, I can't. I can't even think about it. If I start thinking about it, I start, ooh. You know, like Hannibal Lecter in his cell. You know, it's like, no, don't go there. Don't go there. Yeah, I was about to enjoy someone's liver with some fava beans. But, <laughs> but I decided, no, don't go there. Don't go there. Go with better eyes. And I did. How is it helpful to express negativity? Mechanically, we know that if we express negative emotions, they increase and they form rather nasty habits that later we find it more and more difficult to free ourselves from those habits. So that's no help. But it's the same if we continue to feel negative towards others and don't express it. So if I don't express the negative emotion, but I continue to feel negative toward the person, it's the same thing. We talked about this last week with the object, the thing out there that we're negative about, or our thought about the object when the object is not available. We still get the same impressions. We still feed in the same way. The danger is that we feel superior, and this can be crippling. Superiority, feeling of superiority, is absolutely crippling. Most of us don't see it in ourselves, but think of someone else you know who feels superior. Look at how it cripples their relationships. Look at how it cripples their ability to be with people. They can't be with anybody. They're better than them. And if you can't apply it to yourself just now, maybe later. But eventually you must apply it to yourself. Eventually you must find in you the eyes that feel superior to other people. And you must see what they cost you. And you must go with better eyes. The importance of self-observation is showing us our negativity. Well, who wants to see that? I do. I want to see my negativity. Why? So that I can stop expressing it. So I can stop forming more and more habits about it. So that I can stop going with it. We can't stop it until we can see it. I didn't know that was negative. Trust me, that's negative. Really? Do you think that's negative? Oh, yes, I think that's negative. I think it's rather nice. You should have heard what I wanted to do. <laughs> see, that's what we do. That's how we justify it. We're crazy. So when you start to begin to become aware of your negativity through self-observation, we can then put ourselves in place of others and curtail our negativity toward them. That's really its purpose. Finding out how negative I am, well, that's nice. So what? The added benefit is if I can see how negative I am and that it is in here in me, then it makes it easier that when I do see it, there's not a big chore for me to see your negativity. It's only a big chore to see my own. The only negativity it's hard to find is my own. It's never hard to find yours. That's obvious. You may as well have a billboard. I'm negative. I'm negative. You know, neon signs and with bands blaring, you know, brass band out in front of you with symbols. Here comes here and so-and-so, and they're really negative. It doesn't take any effort at all to see that. But what does take effort is seeing how their negativity and your negativity is the same seeing what's in you and seeing that what is in them is in you. And then suddenly you start to have some compassion for them. Suddenly you start to begin to understand them in a different way. And that can help you, help to keep you from being negative about their negativity. One of the most difficult things in the world that this work asks us to do is tolerate other people's unpleasant expressions. Let's face it, folks. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the hard part of life, tolerating everyone else's unpleasant expressions because everyone's got unpleasant expressions, expressions of negativity, expressions of just unpleasantness. And tolerating them can be difficult. It can be the biggest challenge that we ever face in life. Our own unpleasantness is easy to deal with. We know all about that. It's justified, but their unpleasantness is not. And that is how we learn to deal with it when we can find our unpleasantness and relate it to their unpleasantness that we have justified here, then we can begin to understand over there how they can be unpleasant, what their condition is. Compassion springs from there. I love the idea of being compassionate, but you just can't do it. It takes real work and you have to know how to work to become compassionate. It just doesn't appear. You can't just generate compassion. I don't care what anybody says, you don't generate it. It only comes through self-observation. It only comes through knowing yourself truly, sincerely, genuinely knowing yourself for what you actually are. Then you begin to see other people. But then when you do, if you've really understood how you are and what you are, then you see them with compassion. You can't be negative with a person when you're awake. You can only be negative with a person when you're asleep. You wake up, everything changes. It's amazing. You're asleep on your bed and you're having these dreams and you wake up and everything changes. Oh, wait, I'm not there. I'm here in my bedroom. Your heart may have been pounding, you may have been sweating, you may have been screaming. You wake up and you look around and you go, oh, that was just a dream. In life, things appear one way and in the work, they appear another way. It's just like being awake or being asleep. In life, being asleep, everything appears one way. Now that way may be different, but it's one way, it's a certain way. Then you wake up and it's all different. Well, it's the same way with the work in life. 
because in the work, you're waking up. And when you're in life, you're asleep. So when you begin to wake up, everything starts to appear to be different. Hearing this work, knowing about it, doesn't change you. Only fools think that they can read a book or hear a podcast or, or hear a lecture and think that that's going to change them. It's not going to change you. You've got to do something with it. You've got to apply it. It doesn't do any good to hear about it and just hear about it. It was Jesus who said, those who hear my word and don't do it are like people who build a house on sand. The waves came and the wind blew and the house was knocked over. But people who hear the words that I tell them and then do something about it, I'll tell you what they're like. They're like people who built their house on rock. Then when the waves came and the wind blew and beat against that house, it stood because its foundation was rock, not shifting sand. In any system, it's always the same. You can't just hear it, you've got to do it as well. You can be made negative. I don't care how long you've been in this work. I can make you negative in a heartbeat because I know each of you well enough to know exactly where to push. We can be made negative. How long have you been in this work? You can be made negative. How long have you been trying not to express negative emotions? You can be made negative. And it's not a good idea for any of us to think that we can't because the source of negativity is deep in us all and we need help. When we're negative, we're all wrong. We're cut off from the best thoughts and emotions that we have. Ospensky said, we must become passive to all that happens to us, whatever it is. Taken wrongly, it leads in the wrong direction. Talking about being passive internally, he's not talking about being passive externally. People who hear the words only get them externally. You've got to do something to get them internally. We're negative with others because we take them as conscious. That's it. It's the only time you can be negative with another person is when you're thinking they're conscious. Well, he's doing that on purpose. They aren't doing anything on purpose any more than you do anything on purpose. What do you mean? I do everything on purpose. Yes, right. <laughs> and then you haven't been observing yourself. Because once you begin to observe yourself, you see that you don't have any control. You can't do. Things are happening. You're reacting. Things are just happening. What, how did that happen? I don't know. It just happened. How did you get to work on time? I don't know. Nothing got in my way. It was amazing. There were no accidents on the freeway. The freeway was clear. The car started. I remembered which way to go. I stayed awake long enough to remember I was in my car and what color it was. And I didn't try to get in somebody else's car. How many times have you gone to a parking lot and tried to get in somebody else's car? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll leave that one go then. <laughs> enough. Okay. If it happened once, it was enough to let you know you're asleep. You're walking around. You're asleep with a key in your hand in the parking lot. How many people have you walk around? You're walking around in a parking lot. You see somebody walking around looking for their, where did I park my car? Or they're hitting their little thing, trying to make it beep, <laughs> trying to make the car beep so that nobody else knows they're lost. Like they can't find their car. That's the 11th commandment. Thou shall not be found out. Uh, click, click, click. Oh, I wonder whose car is beeping. And they walk over and turn it off and get in and drive away. No one saw me. It's okay. Yeah, we also think that we do everything consciously and with purpose, with conscious purpose, not just with purpose, but with conscious purpose. Nothing's easier than seeing others as machines, leaving ourselves out. If you can see yourself as a fool, you're able to see the fool in others without blaming them. When you can see the fool in others without blame, this work is having an effect on you. Yes, and this is when we reach the middle of the swing of the pendulum, where we rarely ever spend any time. <laughs> We're over here at this end of the swing. We're over here at this end of the swing. In the middle of the pendulum swing, that's where real understanding comes from, in that quietness. It is generated from that place. So you have to be in that place to generate it. If you want compassion, you want love, you want peace, you want happiness, you have to go to that place. You have to spend some time in that place to generate it. And then you can have it. But you can't generate it on either side of the pendulum swing because it's being consumed there. So whatever you got in the middle is being consumed on either end. You get it? It's a good mental picture. When you're negative with another, it's one of two things. It's either you're feeling superior or you have a lack of understanding of the other person's condition. Better to have a lack of understanding of the other person's condition because you could get an understanding of the other person's condition. But if you're feeling superior, put a knife to your throat. You're in trouble. Get rid of that as quickly as possible. Work on that. Remember your nothingness. Work on your nothingness. Work on perspective. Work on getting that in scale, getting yourself in scale. When you're feeling superior, you've got yourself at a scale. You're starting to think that something matters, and that's not a good idea. It always leads to the wrong place in us. Negative emotions are useless. They lead to hell, and ultimately, they lead to violence. Negative eyes that attack others are in us. What that means is that when you want to be free of them, they will attack you with the same ferocity they attacked others. So if you have been somewhat superior and negative with other people, you're in for a ride because those eyes are strong in you. And when you try to lift your head up, they will try and cut it off.
We picture ourselves as tolerant only because we don't see what goes on in the background. But you're noticing, I hope, through meditation that there you can actually sit next to yourself. Have you noticed this? this is, you sit next to yourself. You're not really sitting there in yourself. You're kind of sitting next to yourself. And you can see that there's so much going on in yourself over there. All this stuff going on. It's thinking, it's feeling, it's having sensations, doing all this stuff. But if you've really gotten to the place where you can kind of sit next to yourself, sit beside yourself, sit behind yourself, as the work would say, then you can look at it and go, well, look at all of that. We have to first change the mental center. We have to start to think in a new way. And then we change the emotional center, and we then feel in a new way, because what the work wishes us to do is to feel in a new way about one another and toward one another. And I don't mean just people here, I mean people on the planet. Mm -hmm. now, it's easy to feel differently toward people here. <laughs> For some, it's harder. For some, it's easier. Steve's eyebrows went up, you know. <laughs> and it's not easier. These people are the worst. I have a much better time with the people in life. Yes, you do. It's true, because you can fool them easier. It's the people here you can't fool as easily, and so they're not as much fun. Observe yourself from the standpoint of negative states. Be sincere. When you're negative, admit that you're negative. Then say to yourself, I have a right not to be negative. This is self-remembering, putting ourselves under higher centers. And see what happens. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised, maybe not surprised, but you'll certainly be pleased 